uh, I mean, it happens every single year, it seems like, but it's no less exciting. Uh, absolutely, and uh, I, I'm, I can't wait. I don't know, you can't wait. It's about to start, and we've been, we've been walking around all day waiting for this kind of Final Four. That's what we've been waiting for. Yeah, now, uh, for anyone that was watching, I believe it was actually in the other account, unfortunately, but uh, we did get to stop, and we had a quick interview with some of the coaches and alternate captains or captains and alternate captains from Saginaw Valley and Grand Valley. And it was so funny talking to them because they were maybe 20 feet away from each other, but they didn't want to disclose any of their thoughts, feelings, plans, nothing like that, uh, in fear of the other team kind of hearing what they were thinking. Uh, and it just shows you just the level of competitiveness these two teams have against each other. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And you can see they're coming out throwing. I, I know... You could probably hear the impact on the wall below us. Uh, Saginaw Valley is look is out for blood right now. I really see them uh, doing well this game. Now, with Grand Valley being the higher seed, uh, they obviously chose to be on this side first, meaning that they'll have that brick wall advantage in the second half. Uh, and you know, it might not sound like much of an advantage, but there was a good example there. That blue ball you see rolling back on the left side, that was one that got thrown, bounced off the wall, and they got it right back. It is a huge advantage when every single ball counts. You can see players in the back that are uh, that are either rusting their arm or they are uh, you know, the blockers and they just don't have a ball advantage yet and there's too many people on the field. They're, they're making sure the balls stay forward and that the aggression continues. So the people in the back are still being productive members of this team. Yeah, and, uh, you know, it was one of the things, unfortunately, I didn't, I didn't get a chance to talk to either team about, but it's something I'm interested in. Uh, these are two teams that, to the best of my knowledge, they have not strict rules, but I think they kind of limit what they let their players do the night before. You know, for other teams, uh, this Saturday night, the, after the first evening of the tournament is kind of a night to go out and meet other teams and party. Um, but I know for these two teams, this second day is super important so they want all their guys in top shape so uh, I'd love to get to talk to some of the captains later and ask you know are there rules for your players uh, the night on you know for Saturday night I mean so both teams feeling each other out at the moment it looks like maybe only two players sidelined for Grand Valley right now and a significant number of Saginaw sitting out and, you know, if the seeds are anything to go by, that's kind of what this game should look like. And I don't think anyone's going to be surprised if Grand Valley starts to kind of dominate this game. And it'll be unfortunate. I mean, Grand Valley has been winning and has been dominating the sport for pretty much its entirety. So it's really always a nice, refreshing thing to see them not in the finals. Not to say that I don't like Grand Valley. They're nice people. But, hey, I just want, I just want different people uh, playing in the finals. I want a different national champion every once in a while. All right, two and a half minutes into this game, still relatively even. Again, uh, Saginaw Valley with a slight advantage. The other game going on in our round of four, we've got uh, JMU. I believe I would consider JMU one of the dark horse teams of this tournament. I know people are talking about them saying they're a good team, but they don't have nearly the tournament history background. I mean, right now we have Grand Valley, Saginaw Valley, and Central Michigan you know, household names in college dodgeball against JMU, a team that I wasn't familiar with before this tournament. Uh, exactly. And they're from uh, Virginia. So like we said, uh, Townsend, when they lost, it's also from that area. And they all grouped together and, and made a cheer for East Coast rather than a, a you know, a, like a unified thing against the, the rest of the college dodgeball world, which is now, Michi now left with Michigan teams. Yeah, uh, it would be pretty fantastic to see an East Coast team, you know, compete against one of these two for the final game. Nice trap against the floor there for number 36 from Grand Valley, Nordberg. So both teams playing pretty defensive right now. Uh, Saginaw Valley with a slight ball advantage, I believe, but Grand Valley with the man advantage. Another one goes out for Saginaw Valley. Number 56, a hit off the foot. Now watch, you know, something that uh, we've both been talking about all weekend. Watch how few throws at chest height both of these teams will make. Uh, most of the times the balls are skimming just above ground level. You very rarely see a ball go at someone above their knees. Um, or at least the flight path has the, uh, the, the downward spiral that many grippy throws can have. So your goal is never to hit someone in the chest. 
uh, unless you, it's very clear that you're going to get them like you catch them, catch them blindsided or a cross court throw because it's just too easy to catch, to be honest. You know, the other thing I'm amazed at, uh, you know, compared to some other teams, you have teams with very, very vocal sidelines. Both teams' sidelines very, very quiet, and I'm seeing a lot of Grand Valley sidelines are watching Saginaw, and Saginaw sidelines are watching Grand Valley. So they're, you know, I don't know if that's something they planned or they just know this is our time to get a good view of this other team. Because even though they've played each other, I'm sure dozens upon dozens of times, you constantly need to be aware, wow, big cross court hit there on number 28 for Grand Valley, uh, Klopik. I'm sure I'm not saying that right. That whole non-communication thing from the sideline, I think that's a crutch for teams that are a little bit less experienced than these two. This allows people to actually communicate on the court rather than having everybody scream at them. That's actually sometimes has caused um, uh, like shot clock violations because you just don't know what the heck they're saying. If you have good enough team members that just are focused, you don't need that sideline yelling at you and getting you confused. So I I'm kind of happy about that. Right, another big kill there for Grand Valley. Almost resulted in a team catch, it looked like to me. But uh, Saginaw Valley wasn't able to lock it down. Eight players in for Saginaw. It's like, uh, maybe only nine players in for Grand Valley. Let me check. Yeah, so really only a one-man advantage for Grand Valley. It wasn't nearly as significant as I thought. Oh wow, and there's one, okay, number 17, I believe. Yeah, number 17 for Grand Valley, just barely hit on the foot. Yeah, and that puts us at even numbers for the time being. It sounds like someone might have opened the emergency fire door, so we'll see what comes of that. Whoa, wow. The Grand Valley answers really quick. Really big headshot on number 12 for Saginaw, and he's taking his time walking off the court. So six players left in. Yeah, six players left in for Saginaw right now. One more. If they lose one more player, they switch down to that 10-second shot clock, which doesn't sound like a lot, but it is so painful when having the ball advantage is really the only thing that will kind of bring you out. Of, uh, of being down for the man advantage, I guess. Yeah, being smart when that uh, 10 second shot clock comes up is critical, especially for teams like this, because you just, over the course of two or three minutes, can maintain a ball advantage and then just slowly whittle down the other team. And it's exhausting for that other team to sit there and throw every 10 seconds. Right, so, okay, very aggressive plays from Grand Valley. Number 62 for Grand Valley Hillbrand, just barely getting out of the way of that absolute cannon of a throw. So I would say, without beyond a shadow of a doubt, this is the game that these two teams, this is what they've been saving their arm for all day. Um, both of uh, Really? Uh-oh, wait, wait, wait. Okay. Okay, ref called it out. Say, a couple of Saginaw players getting a little heated off that call. So we're back to even numbers, 6-6. Six, six. Sudden death. No. No. It's not how sudden death works, no. Six on six. 16-20 left in this round for Grand Valley versus Saginaw Valley. Uh, nine minutes and 40 seconds left in the game uh, for JMU versus Central Michigan. Both games, still no points on the board. Oh, number 68 for Saginaw Valley. Tried to go for that block uh, right off the top of his feet. He just couldn't get, it, couldn't get the ball low enough for that block. It's the problem when you're, I don't know, 6'9", whatever that guy is. All right, number three and number four for Grand Valley, Maureen Bailey pushing up on the right. Big throw blocked by Saginaw. Quick push back from Saginaw, who has the ball advantage right now. They won't, they won't 
Not sure. Oh, an okay, so that was... Oh my goodness, somehow I missed a two-player swing. Now Maloney's calling a block or a, uh, uh, that it hit the ball first. Uh, I, 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 missed like two, I missed two outs. Uh, only four players left in for Grand Valley. Still five in for Saginaw, so both teams on a 10-second shot clock now. Nice block. Oh, and he wasn't looking for the cross court, but I believe that was a one for one. It was indeed, so three left in for uh, Grand Valley, four in for Saginaw. This is impressive, you know, based on how this game was starting, uh, it seemed like, and, and you know, maybe it just seemed, I thought Grand Valley was being a lot more aggressive. So maybe it just seemed to me like they were taking early lead, but I, you know, I don't think they ever had a big lead at any point in this game. We're showing a pretty steady upload. If someone else can let us know if they're having latency issues. That was a catch for Saginaw. This is impressive here. This, I, you know, I was not expecting this at all. Uh, we've got Saginaw Valley up three men. Unfortunately, they're still on the 10 second shot clock. Um, so one more man in for Saginaw Valley would almost guarantee them the win because they would be riding up that. I don't know what the, mm, okay. Yeah, Spencer, we can't tell. We're getting a pretty solid upload speed from us. Try to restart live stream and see if that fixes it. If not, we'll try to hard restart uh, after this point. Okay, let's see. Number five, DeYoung, and number four, Bailey, still in for Grand Valley. Struggling with that 10 second shot clock. Saginaw Valley, obviously, with a massive ball advantage at Saginaw Valley on the shot clock now, making their throws. Nothing came it for either team. 13.29 left in this half, so I would say we will for sure be seeing a point going down. I can't imagine this lasting more than 13 minutes. Calling off the ball for Saginaw. Graham Valley also struggling with that 10 second shot clock. Cross court throw from Bailey. Saginaw Valley rushing forward, save themselves another ball. Bailey going to go back in to try to stop a ball that's on the right-hand side. So at this point, neither team being very aggressive. Both of them just uh, riding out that 10-second shot clock. Uh, with the way that the balls are dispersed right now, Grand Valley has more than enough to allow for blocking. Uh, so, you know, at this point, even though they're down two men, mm, they've got a bit of an advantage just from the number of balls they've got. Uh, right now, only two balls on Saginaw's side, leaving three men without any way to block, but that sets them up for catches. Here's the thing. The two Grand Valley players are going to throw their arms out eventually. It is going to tire them out. Saginaw Valley has five people that they can rotate throws from, and they're deep enough to where all five of those mean something. So. Oh, wow. That was perfect. That was a very good cross-court move. Hearing a lot of noise, and it looks like JMU has a huge number advantage over Central Michigan. Seven minutes and 20 left to go in that game. Still no points. Okay, looks like we are streaming fine for other people. So, yeah, maybe try to force restart uh, the app or online, Spencer, and let us know if that gets any better. Wow, fast counterattack, but he's got to watch for those cross courts. Okay, had someone there with him. You know, I, Ben, I think the only thing that's going to resolve anything here is catches. Hit the ground. Yeah, still only three. Wow, so was, see, I missed a swing again. Three players in for Saginaw, two for Grand Valley. So this is, point is not, not even close to being over. Grand Valley with a huge ball advantage. Saginaw Valley really only having one ball at a time. I think they've popped at least three this game. Still got number four, number five in for Grand Valley, having all of the balls but one. Oh, that, that is huge, that is huge. And I had just said it, a catch was gonna be the only thing that was gonna change anything in this game. 
This is huge. Four players in for Saginaw. Still, I believe, number five in for Grand Valley. Ten minutes left. Grand Valley is going to have some real trouble here. Getting a kill there. Good duck. Oh, and another kill, which puts it down to 2v1. Wow. Timeout called by Grand Valley, I believe. Wow, wow, we wow. I would not have done that because the, all of the momentum was on Grand Valley. It is not smart for a coach to, uh, to call a timeout when the momentum is on your side. You want to keep it rolling. Yeah, but see, even with that momentum, they're still at a disadvantage. So, and I mean, this is the perfect chance. Think about how long number five. He's been in for practically the entire game. He needs to take a breather. 15 minutes of dodgeball in a row. Yeah, so 15 straight minutes of dodgeball. This was done as just a way to let him catch his breath. Still no points over on the Central Michigan game. Uh, looks like they have whittled away JMU's man advantage. I see three players on for Central Michigan and three or four on for JMU. All right, looks like we're getting ready to get started back up over here. All right, so at this stage, if you're Saginaw, what do you do? Three men, you, you, are, you are down, you, sorry, oh, two men, is that it? Just two, oh, wow, sorry. I, oh, yeah, he got that kill right before they called timeout. Yeah, someone's mentioning that they can only see Saginaw Valley, not Grand Valley. We, we understand that as soon as the second half comes up, you will get to see all of Grand Valley play. It's just it's impossible for us to get both teams at, uh, in one, in, with one camera. Yeah, uh, actually, for now, let's try to follow the Grand Valley player since that'll be a big one for him. Shot Looks, clock violation. Shot clock violation. Oh, and see, that is huge because Grand Valley was setting on a treasure trove. Felix having to run out on court and have Saginaw Valley's players go back to the sideline. Felix having to remind some of the captains that this was not a timeout, so they're not allowed on the court. This is going to be big for Saginaw. Yes, and that is a confirmed hit on DeYoung, meaning Saginaw Valley gets the first point. What an amazing point that was. We've got a big game going on over here with JMU. Uh, let's see. Okay, we're going to go ahead and out just before the hit on number five, DeYoung. I guess Felix was arguing in that favor. That's what we were saying, Felix. Yeah, that's what it sounded like. So apparently there was a call for a timeout made by Saginaw Valley's captain. Oh, my gosh. Oh, my gosh. Whoa, and he was not paying attention there. Wow. So, wow, just wow. The game was the game was over, but they they had called a timeout, so they couldn't count the throw. Yeah, uh, head referee Felix Peroni was actually he as soon as the celebration started, he moved out. Uh, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. Oh, 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 clock violation on Grand Valley. Okay. Interesting. Now this could be a good thing or a bad thing. What this means is Grand Valley, their two players, are going to be all the way on the back line. Uh, Saginaw Valley's going to have to throw. Looks like maybe we have a ruptured ball. Do you have a ruptured ball for Saginaw? It's going to swap that one out. Swapping it out. <laughs> All right, so anyway, as I was saying, he's going to have to make a throw here because obviously there's no shot clock. So he can't make a catchable throw here. So we'll see what he does. High over DeYoung. Grand Valley. Bit of controversy here. Okay, so uh, that's, that's strange. I, I don't really know what to do about that. Okay, big news, JMU did just take a point from Central Michigan. That's a pretty big deal. Got 220 left in that JMU Central Michigan game, 822 left here in this game. Really quick, oh wow. 
Grand Valley obviously calling that they saw the hit. Nope, no good because it was off the ceiling. It was uncatchable. And you know, that's really unfortunate because had it not been for the structure in the ceiling, that would have been a catchable ball. But that's part of playing in a gym. So a big turnaround there. And you know, to be honest, Saginaw Valley shot themselves in the foot. They had the win, but there was a timeout called by the captain. So that was obviously a huge mistake. That was a Dewey defeats Truman. Dewey defeats Truman moment. Well, did you see what happened? Over here, yeah, they, they, uh, Saginaw they, Valley had it, but the captain had called for a timeout. So, do you want to do you want to pause? For oh, a right, sorry, we are going to pause. Sorry, I thought we'd already done.